Ladies and gents, when hello again, welcome to another Reflected Reality Simulations video. My name is Graham, and today we're going to be uh, looking at a few items that uh, have been requested in the comments section on my previous videos. We're going to be look at, looking at uh, approach charts uh, very briefly, and then we'll look at some wind correction uh, to fill in some of the gaps in the radio navigation video. So first things first, the approach charts. This is the uh, Sky Vector website. You're looking at the uh, Juno sectional chart and the airfield is uh, Yakutat. Quite a, a favorite destination in uh, flight sim. I remember flying here with the uh, Glacier Bay scenery back in FS2004 with the uh, Dream Fleet B58 and A36 Bonanza. Um, it's an area I really quite like flying in. Um, and one of the good things about uh, flying in the US in flight sim is all the charts are, are freely available. So you can get the sectional charts on Sky Vector. Sky Vector also generates its own uh, world VFR chart. It looks very similar to the sectional in the US, but you've got the data available uh, outside uh, the US. It's basically available all over the world as well. They also provide uh, airways charts, so uh, Sky Vector's own low and high airways charts, as well as where it's available, the authorities uh, low and high charts. But what we're interested in today is the sectional. We're going to uh, right click on Yakutat, click the link here, and that takes us to the page for the airport itself. And we're going to go down and have a look at uh, the instrument approach chart, because that's the most important one for getting the aircraft uh, onto the ground. We're going to look at the ILS arrival onto runway 11. So this is the uh, approach chart here. It's uh, really quite uh, simple to understand. You've got the plan view here, which is basically a top-down view of the approach uh, track. And further down, you've got the approach uh, profile, so a side-on view. The FAA charts have got uh, a little runway diagram down in the bottom right, as well as some of the minimas to use here. And most charts, regardless of where they come from, have the same kind of uh, layout. This is what um, Navigraph looks like. It provides you with the uh, the Lido charts. That's just a screenshot from the uh, Navigraph website. But the uh, Lido charts, uh, it, similar to the Navtech charts, they're very uh, very common uh, arrangement. Really, you've got the uh, plan view, and at the bottom you've got the uh, the profile view down here, and the minima are published just below that as well. The Lido charts are really quite. Uh, quite easy to use. They're very good for uh, supporting the uh, FMS information that uh, the aircraft has. Good for cross-checking. Uh, maybe not as easy to fly the aircraft uh, using uh, old-style navigation. They're very much designed for modern RNAV environment. If you look at uh, another kind of chart, this is what the uh, UK uh, AIP publishes. Again, it's very similar. You've got the plan view at the top, uh, the uh, different arrival tracks you can use, the profile view, and uh, the minima at the bottom. The thing to be aware of is when you're looking at uh, charts published by the authorities, quite often they don't uh, repeat information on the charts. The charts are designed for people that are going to make charts for pilots. They're not necessarily designed to be pilot interpreted straight away. What I mean by that is if you look at the minima on this chart, uh, it only gives you the uh, the uh, obstacle uh, obstacle clearance altitudes. It doesn't give you the actual uh, minima you could work to, and it doesn't give you the visibility requirements for that airfield. It tells you somewhere in the uh, AIP uh, how to calculate the minima based on the airfield lighting, that sort of thing, but it doesn't publish it straight away on the chart. So for flight sim, it's perfectly serviceable, but uh, you might find it quite frustrating uh, swapping back and forth between chart vendors. Uh, I think the Navigraph approach is probably the, the best one because uh, in real life we have a, a single charting company that provide charts for all the uh, airfields we operate to in the world. So if you have the uh, Lido charts, then all of your charts will look like this. It's got the same symbology. And likewise with the Navtech or the uh, Jeppesen charts, they, uh, they look the same for various different fields around the world. But what we're interested today is uh, Yakutat, because we're going to be flying this uh, in the sim in a few moments. So I mentioned the plan view first and foremost. There's a few items on this that are relevant to us. Um, before I go much further, I just want to say I've not done any, uh, I've not done that much uh, real IFR flying in the US. Uh, I've done a, a little bit as part of some training I did out there, but all of my uh, IFR flying commercially is in uh, in Europe. So if things are a little bit different, uh, I do apologize for that. Um, I'm not an authority on these charts. It's just really enough to get you through uh, as a sim pilot. 
So first and foremost, we're looking at the initial approach fix. This is where your uh, approach procedure would begin under norm normal circumstances. And there's uh, one or two on here. You'll see this is an ILS or localizer arrival with DME onto runway 11. There's an initial approach fix over Ocean Cape. So that's the uh, NDB you can see down here. It's probably a procedure turn. There's the procedure turn symbol out on 250 and back in on 070 and down to the ILS. There's also an initial approach fix over here at Lamar. Uh, if you're direct to Lamar using RNAV navigation, you'd probably fly, fly the arc around here and then come back in. There's also an IF at Wart, so you could go direct there. And there's an initial fix at Tejano up here. Um, the initial fix is a little bit different. Uh, you can get vectored directly to the initial fix. There's different rules on how, uh, what kind of vector you can get towards the initial fix, but uh, controllers can uh, aim you at the initial fix if it's uh, allowed by their rules as well. Basically, from a flight sim perspective, start at the IAF, any of the IAFs or the IF, um, as long as you're on the final approach track, by the time you get to this point here, this is the final approach fix, the little cross you can see, then everything should work out. Worst case scenario, you can take vectors to the final approach fix, but here it's only 4.2 uh, miles from the field. It's quite a low platform you'd have there. So this approach, uh, you could either do this uh, DME arc to come back down onto ILS, or what we're going to do is fly to Ocean Cape, the NDB, fly outbound, do the procedure, and then back in again. When you're doing an instrument approach, uh, you're going to brief it before you actually fly it. And if you brief it on the ground, or you brief it in the cruise, that's, uh, that's fine. If you're single pilot, you're probably best briefing it uh, in the comfort of your own home and then uh, have a think about how you're going to fly it uh, long before you actually get there. But for flight sim purposes, it's, it's dead straightforward. What we're interested in is the approach category uh, of the aircraft. So light singles would be category A. Piston twins, uh, faster aircraft would be probably approach category B and things like the 737, A320 up here in approach category C. It depends on the final approach speed the aircraft has. Uh, you can do some googling on that. That's the ICAO approach category you're interested in. But let's say that my uh, Beechcraft Baron is going to be category B today. Well, what we've got here are the minima we can work to. So I'm going to be doing an ILS arrival. My minima here would be 233 feet on the altimeter. Uh, it's important to note if you've got a rad alt, uh, unless you're doing uh, CAT 2, CAT 3 arrivals, the radio altimeter is not uh, really going to be used for the minimums. It's a barometric minima. So 233. Uh, in the US, this is the visibility uh, tube 4. That would be uh, 2,400 feet visibility required, or just under half a mile to perform this approach. In Europe, it's more common to see it uh, written in meters. You might have a met vis uh, requirement, or you might have a runway visibility requirements. So 550 meters RVR would be quite common for a CAT1 approach. Uh, I think these uh, lower values here, the lowercase values, uh, certainly this 200 to a half, I think that's a military thing uh, in, uh, in the FAA charts. Uh, so I'm not going to worry about that. And this would be the threshold crossing height. So if you're at 233 feet barrow, the uh, field elevation is 33 feet. So you're actually only 200 feet above the threshold. Touchdown zone elevation 33. That should be reasonably straightforward. What we'll do is we'll get into the sim and uh, we'll have a look at this. We'll have a look at flying it. You probably want to have a think about the missed approach procedure as well. It's shown on the plan view with the dashed lines here and also uh, these little icons here. So this would be a head to 1000 feet, right turn climbing to 2400 feet to the Yankee Alpha Kilo to hold. And that's kind of what's drawn on here as well. Okay, so let's uh, go into X-Plane and have a look at it. So first things first, let's have a look at the aircraft setup. Uh, we're currently at 3000 feet. Uh, as before, the autopilot's uh, selected and we're overhead uh, Yakutat at the moment. We're going to have a look at some wind compensation first of all, and then we'll fly that uh, procedure turn from Ocean Cape uh, outbound and come back in on the ILS. Hopefully it should be quite straightforward. I've got uh, the Yakutat uh, VOR tuned on uh, both nav radios, 113.3 and uh, I've got um, Ocean Cape 
mentioned as well, Ocean Cape here, 385 on the uh, ND, uh, ADF. I've also set up some wind in the sim today. The wind is coming directly at the south and it's going to be uh, probably around uh, 15 to 20 knots at this point. So what I'll do is I'll take the pause off and uh, we'll proceed uh, out to the southeast and we'll chat about wind correction first and foremost. Okay, so what we want to do is to have a, a method to calculate wind that doesn't involve um, much in the way of calculations. Um, I should have put the autopilot on. Let's do that. Okay, so you can calculate winds based on a triangle of velocity thing, uh, based on your uh, E6B or the, the whiz wheel, the little uh, circular slide rule that uh, you see in all the uh, pilot magazines for sale. Uh, it is pretty useful if you're a student pilot and you're learning how to do cross country nav, then it does provide you with a, a simple and visual way of calculating drift angles. But we don't really want to have to do that for every single leg or uh, heading that we have to fly, what we need is a visual method to do it in the flight deck. And it's really quite simple. There's, there's two rules of thumb we need to use. The first thing is we need to calculate what our maximum drift angle is, and that is reassuringly simple. The first thing I need to know is how many nautical miles per minute I'm doing. So if I was travelling at 60 knots, then that would be one nautical mile per minute. And for general, general aviation aircraft, this is really quite easy. So it's either going to be 60 knots, one mile per minute, 90 knots, one and a half, 120, that'd be two miles per minute, or as we are at the moment, about 150 knots, true airspeed, that's uh, two and a half nautical miles per minute. So looking at the weather forecast, or if you're fortunate enough to be flying in a sim, you can set the weather yourself. Uh, you know exactly or roughly what the wind speed and direction is going to be. Not interested in the direction at the moment, it's just the speed I'm interested in. So if my wind speed was 25 knots, let's say, and I'm doing 150 knots true airspeed, what I'm going to do is take that 150, call it 2.5 miles per minute, and take my wind speed, 25 knots, and divide it by 2.5. That gives me a maximum drift of 10 degrees. The wind speed in the sim is uh, about 18 to 20 at the moment, so divided by 2.5 it's probably going to be around, uh, let's say, 8 to 9 degrees maximum drift. Forecasts are quite uh, variable and it really is just a rule of thumb to get you in the right ballpark. But let's see how it works out. We're looking for 9 degrees maximum drift and I know because I've set it it's coming directly at the south. So first things first, I'm going to turn the aircraft onto that southerly heading and point it directly into the wind. I've got the GPS here as well, we can see the, uh, the track over the ground and the ground speed, so both of those are going to be quite useful. When I'm flying directly into the wind, obviously my track and my heading uh, should be really quite similar. Uh, there's not much drift angle when you're going straight into the wind. So on that 180 heading, I'm seeing a track up here just coming to about 180 degrees. But my ground speed, 150 uh, TAS, probably a little bit more in fact it shows about uh, 14 to 15 knots on the head at the moment, and that's quite reasonable. So I said my maximum drift is uh, going to be around about 9 degrees. Let's see how that works out. I'm going to turn 90 degrees to the left onto an easterly heading, and if I point the aircraft at 090, with 9 degrees uh, maximum drift, I'm looking for about, uh, well, about 0, 081. The wind's coming from the south here, so it's going to push me away onto about 081. Let's see how that works out. So just coming uh, it's more or less there. About 090 and I said, what, 0, um, 0, 081? We've got 0, uh, 083 showing at the moment. So it's not too far off. It's just a, a rule of thumb. It, and based on the wind forecast, it just gets you to within 2 or 3 degrees of where you need to be. And that's good enough to refine uh, anything for instrument navigation or radio navigation. But that's all fine and well. We can either fly directly into the wind or we can fly uh, at 90 degrees to the wind. We've worked out our maximum drift. 
and we know that heading into the wind we've got zero drift. But what if I want to do something else? Let's say I want to uh, fly outbound, not on 090, but 150. Well, first things first, let's put it onto 150. And what I'm going to do is once I'm uh, level on 150, I'm going to imagine that there's a line drawn from the center of the aircraft symbol here out to the uh, edge of the uh, edge of the uh, HSI here. We're going to read it almost like a clock face. Okay, so on 150, I'm going to come around to where the wind is, southerly heading, and I'm going to come down to this imaginary line. So there's an, Im an imaginary line here between the center and the edge. 180, which is the source of my wind, coming down here, I'm going to say that's about 40% between the aircraft and the radius. So 40% of the maximum drift. Max drift, I said, was going to be about uh, 8 or 9 degrees. I say 8 degrees. I'm going to use 40% of that. It's about 4 degrees. Uh, just a little bit less than 4 degrees. So let's have a look, see what heading I've actually got. That's about uh, 149 or 150. The wind's pushing us this way. So about uh, 4 degrees, it's going to say 145 or 146, that, that kind of area. There you go, track of 145. And it works both ways. So let's go around onto uh, 120. In fact, let's go all the way around. We'll point the aircraft back to our jacket at. There's other ways of doing this. This is just uh, one rule of thumb, but I like it because it's quite visual. If you've got the uh, the HSI, it really works quite well. If you've got an aircraft that's got a really, really, really old directional gyro, it might be an edge reading directional gyro like this. Uh, the, the compass is uh, reading on the edge here. You do get vintage aircraft that have got gyros in the same presentation. Uh, forget about it. They're basically VFR aircraft these days. <laughs> I flew an aircraft that was like that, and I used the uh, the GPS extensively just to uh, give me that uh, that awareness, if you like. So we're coming around onto heading of uh, a track of 300. Let's see what sort of drift will be needed to fly with this uh, localizer with this uh, course deviation bar in the center. Because if I put it right on the uh, top of the uh, pointer there, the wind's coming out of the south round about here. So it's going to blow me to the right, which is not really what I want. So again, imagining a, a line from the centre of the aircraft out to the uh, edge of the HSI. Wind's coming out of the south. That's more or less 90% of the, uh, the drift there. So I'm probably thinking 90% of uh, 8 degrees, uh, eight, 8 degrees being the maximum drift. Let's say it's going to be 7 or 8. So I'm looking for probably uh, 306, 307 on the thing. It's actually showing 305 there, so it's a, it's a pretty good rule of thumb. It gets you really quite close. What that means, though, is um, I need to come about... Uh, well, let's say if I come 10 degrees to the left of the track, I'm going to be closing at uh, a rate of about... Uh, closing angles about 3 degrees. So that's probably not enough to get back on track. Let's go to the uh, westerly heading initially. Now we should be closing. The wind's uh, directly across, so although I've got 270, my track is going to be about uh, 278, 279. And you can see it up here. So to fly this uh, deviation bar in the middle, uh, I don't want to set uh, 300 uh, degrees. I want to probably set uh, 292, 293, and we'll see how that goes. So it's about 293. In the real world, it's really quite difficult uh, to fly within one or two degrees accuracy in this kind of aircraft. So we just do the best job we can. So put it roughly where, it, uh, where I think it should be. Watch it for a few seconds and uh, come back and check on it. Of course, in the real world, the, uh, the weather forecast or the wind forecast could be completely wrong. And uh, you just have to adjust as you go. 
but it gives you a good way to, to kind of assess the wind, just a, a little rule of thumb to work with. There you go, it's more or less uh, tracking as we expect. So what I'll do is I'll just spin that out of the way, and where this gets really useful is down here. Remember, push the head and pull the tail. Well, if I know what my max drift is, by using the wind coming out of the south technique, I know that uh, my track line is about 8 degrees to the right of this needle. So if I was to do, uh, let's say, put the, uh, the needle at the uh, top, if there was nil wind I'd be flying straight towards the beacon, but my track line is over here, so that's going to push the head of the needle away, which is not what we want at all. You can see it's starting to move straight away because we're really quite, quite close in. So I want to push the needle the other way. I'll move it around to um, 285, and then with my maximum drift uh, applied of about uh, 8 degrees, it's going to be around about here, so it should gradually start to push it back onto 300. There we go. What I want to do though is to fly this instrument approach. I want to fly outbound on the uh, 295 from Ocean Cape. So let's set 295 initially and that will give me about uh, 8 degrees to the right of that and it will push the needle back onto 295. While we're doing that I'll set the uh, ILS approach as well. It's 115 as the, uh, the front course. And here as well. Just keeping an eye on the uh, on the RMI there, or the ADF. Okay, so when I'm passing outbound, uh, the chart says that I can go down to one thousand eight hundred feet. So I'm waiting to overhead the Ocean Cape. I'll start bringing the, uh, the power back a little bit, start slowing down as well. Remember those approach categories I mentioned? Well, one of the key things about that is the, uh, the speed you can fly these procedures at. A little cheat outside. There's the airfield. Don't be afraid to cheat when you're learning this stuff. It's, it's not really cheating if you're helping yourself out. So Ocean Cape is uh, further out on the approach track. We could cheat by uh, kind of back coursing the localizer as well, but we'll try and do it on the uh, NDB, see how it goes. Okay, one of the things I should have mentioned from the chart is the, uh, the DME. In this case, the ILS doesn't have its own DME, so I'll we'll leave uh, the uh, Yakutat uh, VO, uh, VOR tune to get a DME from there. So watching for Ocean Cape passing uh, underneath. So we know we're running outbound uh, just now, so what I can do is start, uh, start descending. Going down to 1,800 feet. There you go, so the NDB is going down the uh, left side of the aircraft. I'll just adjust the heading a little bit. So, tracking outbound from the NDB, I'm going to pull the tail towards the course that I want. I'm interested in 295, I've got about 10 degrees, uh, 8 degrees of drift, so 285 at the very minimum, and we need to correct a little bit, so I'll set 275. So though it's 20 degrees off, it's only about uh, 10 degrees uh, of uh, track divergence there.
they've got about five degrees or, or more to go. Speed's 120 knots, that's looking good. And what I'm waiting for, uh, as before, is the glide slope coming up to the uh, level. And then I'll make the procedure turn. 295 uh, on the tail of the needle about now, so I want to set uh, probably about 287, and we'll see how that goes. There's a the glide slope coming through. So my uh, outbound track is uh, 250. Let's set that initially 250. Level off there. And uh, track 250, but uh, we've got more or less all of the wind there. A little bit more power required. So we'll probably come about uh, 10 degrees to the left. Not time, we're looking for about 30 seconds winds level, so when we get to about uh, 25 seconds past, that'll do it. I'm going to turn right and go in on the 070. So turning inbound, you can probably arm the approach mode just now. Again, you could be flying this uh, manually as well. I'm just doing it on the autopilot because it makes life a little bit easier to fly and uh, talk and explain things at the same time. Coming inbound, put the gear down and select the uh, approach flaps. Here it comes. So it's navving. Clean that up be interesting to watch which uh, which heading the aircraft flies as well. Probably going to be about uh, 8 to 9 degrees nose into wind once it's uh, fully captured. Just keeping an eye on the speed as well, I don't want it to decay too much. So it wasn't the neatest intercept in the world from the autopilot, but uh, not too bad. There you go. So if the calculations are correct, it'll probably stop uh, it's flying it in nav, but it'll probably uh, fly heading roughly around there to keep the uh, localizer bar in the middle. Let's see how that goes. Glide slope's uh, starting to move. Suits back. We've got approach flaps and the gears down. Does that bring the props up? So of course the maximum drift's actually increased a little bit now. Rather, we're doing about uh, one and a half miles a minute. So it's probably more in the order of uh, 12 degrees, the maximum drift correction, and that's more or less what we're seeing at the moment. So that's the final approach. So on the glide slope, at this point we'll be checking the heights uh, based on the DME to the uh, uh, Yakutat VOR based on the checking it with the profile view on the charts, just to make sure that we've got the correct glide slope. There are, of course, false glide slopes that can be presented above um, the glide slope. Uh, it's generally why you intercept glide slopes from below. I don't know if X-Plane models uh, false glide slopes, but um, it's good practice to always intercept from below 
or if you are intercepting from above, make sure you verify the heights uh, or the altitudes on the way down the approach. So from here on, it's more or less a, a straightforward ILS sort of uh, track away flying. So there's 117, 115 is what we've got set, it's more or less correct. And the heading, I move the bug out of the way. Yeah, about 126. So about uh, 12 degrees. That's us passing over the beacon. So what I'll do is I'll just uh, pause the sim there and I'll try and recap that uh, that rule of thumb for you. So to calculate uh, the maximum drift, first and foremost, the number of nautical miles per minute we're doing. 60 knots, one nautical mile per minute. That's uh, dead straightforward. If you do 60 in an hour, you do one in the minute. That'd be one, and then 90 would be one and a half, 120 would be two, 150, two and a half, 183. If your final approach speed or your uh, cross country speed even is much above 180 knots, I'd be very surprised if you didn't have a, a GPS with a ground track. So really a, a good rule of thumb to use at uh, the lower speeds. And uh, don't try and divide by halves if it's too complicated, just use the next number up. So rather than using one and a half, we'd use two here, just to make it nice and easy. Look at your forecast wind. So your forecast wind speed is 20 knots. You're doing two miles per minute. Divide 20 by 2, that gives you a maximum drift of 10 degrees. And then all you're doing is using the, uh, the HSI like a clock face. In this case, the wind is out the south. So wind out the south at uh, 20 knots. I'm drawing a line in my mind between the uh, radius here and the center, straight line there. I'm finding the point the wind's originating from. So south in this case, coming down here. And I'm going to say that's about 80% from there to there. So if the wind was 150, it'd be closer to, let's say, 25%. So wind from 150, max drift 10, 25%, percent two and a half, three degrees correction. Wind from 180 or south, around about uh, 75%, so seven and a half, eight degrees correction. And it really is as simple as that. It's just something to get you started uh, to make an appropriate correction. It really comes into its own when you're doing things like uh, NDB holds. And obviously keeping that course deviation bar centralized there, well that's quite easy. There's usually autopilot modes for that and you can see any deviations quite quickly. Where it really comes into its own with that max drift calculation especially is uh, looking at your uh, ADF uh, or the RMI down here. Look at your track indicator and saying, ah well the wind's coming from the south, it's pushing me this way. Uh, I know my maximum drift is 10 degrees, so that's going to be about, uh, I don't know, 6 degrees. I'll be 6 degrees to the left of that line there. Easy peasy. Um, you'll see a few degrees of error if you try it for real. It's not exact science. It's just, uh, it's just a ballpark figure to get you going in the right direction. So we've looked at... Uh, the approach charts and how to read the uh, the minimums off them. We've also looked at the uh, initial approach fix. If you're using the uh, GNS uh, 530 or the 430, you can see in here that uh, if we select an approach, uh, let's go down, hang on, I'll do it this way. We'll pick up the uh, ILS approach we're interested in and you'll see that they're the fixes we, we mentioned before. You've got Lamar, Ocean Cape, and uh, wart as the IAFs. And uh, if we pick Ocean Cape, we should see uh, the, the uh, GNS try and draw a procedure turn for us out from Ocean Cape. I think it's got a little bit confused there, but uh, usually it does not too bad a job. If you get any questions on uh, what you've seen in this video, um, please feel free to leave them uh, in the comments uh, section. Uh, the video is trying to just uh, clear up a few questions that some of my subscribers had on the channel. So hopefully it's not raised too many other questions. The uh, drift calculation, best thing to do, get in the sim, set uh, wind from one of the cardinal points, so north or south, east, west, and then just fly around and observe what your, your track difference is uh, based on the GPS and the, the headings on here and you've got a good rule of thumb to work with as well. As always, uh, any comments or questions, uh, I'm very happy to uh, try and give you some good feedback on that. And uh, thanks very much for listening. I look forward to speaking to you again soon. Thanks. Bye-bye.